Hare Krishna Prabhuji. Hare Krishna. Okay, we'll get started now. We will start with the Mangalacharan prayers, which are in the beginning of the Bhagavad Gita, the introduction. Om Ajnana Timirandhasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bhishtam Sthapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swapadantikam Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Yuta Padakamalam Shri Gurun Vaishnavamscha Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Raghunathan Vitam Tham Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadhutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Dalita Shri Vishakan Vitam Scha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Shri Mate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namine Namaste Saraswati Devi Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschatya Desha Tarine He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostute Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Radhe Vrinda Vaneshwari Vrishabhano Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vanchakal Patarubhyascha, Kripa Sindhubhya Evacha, Patitanam, Pavani Bhyo, Vaishnave Bhyo, Namunama. Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya, Prabhu Nityananda, Shri Advaita Gadadhara, Shri Vasadi Gaurabhakta Vrinda. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Great. So we are going to continue chapter eight. I was hoping to complete it last time, but uh, couldn't. So we will see how much progress we can make this time. Uh, but we will definitely complete chapter eight. We might be left with some time because uh, I, well, you never know, but uh, the remaining portions are not of chapter eight are not a whole lot worth uh, a whole two hours. So either we could end early. Again, I don't want to presume anything. Or if you have any questions so far, please keep them ready. We can have a Q&A discussion. And uh, you can also, uh, I would also invite people to share um, how um, things are going with uh, uh, with the class, anything we, uh, what, what you are liking, anything we can improve any feedback or how are you applying Bhagavad Gita in your life? Um, how is Bhagavad Gita helping you and so on. We can have some open um, conversation towards the end. So if there is time, uh, but I hope there will be time, uh, but you never know. So uh, we are going to start from 8.17. Uh, that's we, we completed till 8.16. And um, the uh, I just wanted to re-emphasize 8.14, uh, which is perhaps the most important verse of the whole chapter. And it is a sharp contrast to the Dhyana Yoga, uh, Dhyana Mishra Bhakti verses that preceded it. And this verse is very, very important because it talks about uh, undivided devotion to Lord Krishna. Lord Krishna says, Ananya Chetata Chetaha Satatam. So Ananya word, and I have, there are several verses. Uh, this is one of the verses where the word Ananya comes. If you want to make a note, there are other several verses in which the word Ananya comes, where Lord Krishna is saying, have your faith exclusively in me. This is a very important point because uh, a lot of people, um, of course, they hear a lot of things, a lot of inputs are received. One must very quickly settle on one path to follow. Um, that is 
uh, that's highly recommended. Life, human life is itself very short and uh, there is not much time to try out one path or the other or the other. As quickly as possible, one should try things out and settle on one. It's like a patient with a very um, um, fast moving disease. There is not much time to try doctors. Let me try this one. Let me try that one. Let me try that one. By that time, the disease will increase and the time for cure will uh, elapse or will, will, will go away. So one must settle and we don't know how short our life is. So we must settle on one sort of track and uh, that is where the word ananya comes. Ananya chetaha satatam. So fixing our mind on Lord Krishna, but Ananya, it could be pick a path. In the Bhagavad Gita, obviously Lord Krishna is saying, come to me. There are many other verses. There is 8.22, if those who want to make notes. 9.13, very, very famous verse. Bhajanti Ananya Manaso, Jyatva Bhutadim Avyayam. Then 11.54 and also 18.66. The word Ananya is not there. But the word Maam Ekam Sharanam is there. Maam Ekam Sharanam Raja. Lord Krishna says, so come exclusively, come to my Maam Ekam. Come to my shelter. Don't go anywhere else. So that's the, you know, um, Lord Krishna is very strongly advising to put one's faith in one path and move forward with it. There used to be a very, fa there is a very famous uh, theological book I don't know the author, but uh, the title of the book was Purity of Heart is to Will One Thing. I'll repeat it. Purity of Heart is to Will One Thing. So that also is kind of uh, having the same theme, putting our faith in one, in one path and moving forward with it rather than jumping and putting your foot in many boats, then, then there will be, you know, you, you will deviate, you will shake and you will fall down. And definitely one should not try to put one's path in sense gratification and spiritual side together. And when I say sense gratification, I don't mean in, in the material world. We are all in the material world. We have to live, we have to sustain, support our life. Uh, in the material terms. I am talking about sense gratification itself, that I can gratify my senses unlimitedly. I can, I can pursue sense gratification for the sake of sense gratification and also pursue devotion. That is like um, a diabetic patient saying, I'm, I'm going to eat a lot of sweets and I'm going to take my diabetes medication as well then you'll have to keep increasing the dose and the day will come when even the dose will not be sufficient and, and you know, bad things will happen. So of course you have to eat food. Even a diabetic patient needs to eat, but he should not eat things which are harmful. And sense gratification, actively pursuing sense gratification is harmful for devotional life. So definitely that should not be the focus. And uh, so 8.14, that was one point. And then Lord Krishna also says, then of course he says, Yo maam smarati nitya shaha tasyaham sulabha partha. So that this process of maam smarati by remembering me, it will be very easy to come to me. Tasyaham tasya aham sulabha partha. I will be very easy to approach. Aham sulabha. I will be very easy to approach. Nitya yuktasya yog, uh, yoginaha. So, uh, and one has to be engaged. Yukta yoginaha. So you have to be engaged. It's not disengagement from anything, but it's engagement. So one has to continue to be engaged. There is engagement in devotional service. One has to do things. One has to try to love God. And just like one loves, uh, you know, some other family member or friend, so loving interactions, which have action involved. So that is the significance of yuktasya um, yoginaha, active engagement in devotional service. 
So that verse is very important. And then now the section we are in, 15 and 16, Lord Krishna is warning us about the same thing that I just said, sense gratification. And Lord Krishna is saying this material world is meant for sense gratification, uh, especially the earth planet and um, is, is definitely there for sense gratification. And this is being called, this entire material world is being called as Dukkhalayam Ashashwatam. It is temporary and it is a place for, place of miseries in 8.15. And Lord Krishna is warning us that we should not try to stay in this world. Sometimes there is happiness. If we do good deeds, we might rise up to Swargaloka, to the heavenly planets, and there'll be a lot of sense gratification, a lot of enjoyment. But once our pious credits are used up, again, we come down to this place, to this earth planet, what is known as Bhuloka, or the group of planets known as Bhuloka. Earth planet is among them. It's a plane, not just a single planet. Uh, this Bhuloka is uh, definitely a place of uh, Dukkha, even in the Swargaloka, there is Dukkha, but much less. At least there is death. There may not be disease. There may not be uh, other kind of problems, material problems, but there is death. So, and then uh, Lord Krishna says that the goal of human life should be to get out of this world, not to stay here. Uh, Lord Krishna is saying in 8.15, that na apnuvanti mahatmanaha samsiddhim paramam gataha. That one should try to get out of this world, not stay in this world. And in 8.16, Lord Krishna is saying that not just this world where we are, the human life is, this bhuloka, but all the planets in the material world, starting from Brahmaloka all the way down, they are all places of misery where there is repeated birth and death. So this is something uh, one should take note of that it's not like there is any place in the whole universe. The Brahma Loka is the place where Lord Brahma lives and Lord Brahma is the one who created the universe. A empty universe was given to him with the basic ingredients in place by Lord Vishnu. And then he was sort of the chief engineer who gave the shape to the whole universe. So even Lord Brahma, who, is, who has given shape to the universe, has a, has a finite lifetime. So what to speak of the universe itself? It is definitely finite. It's not infinite. It may have a very long life or a very long lifetime, but it is still finite and is a place of repeated birth, birth and death. So one should never aspire to stay in this material world. And we had a long discussion, I think last week or the last to last week, what is the problem if we want to stay here? And why, why, why bother about going to the spiritual world? We had a long discussion about that. You can go and review that. And, and if there are questions, we can take questions on, on that topic. Now, uh, one point I wanted to clarify, uh, which is another important point uh, that, uh, maybe I'll show this uh, chart again. So let me try and pull it up. Hmm. Share my screen. Okay, so I hope uh, you can see the screen here. And okay. So you see the Bhuloka over here, the earth planet, and then there are several planes above the Bhuloka. The next one is Bhuvarloka, and then there is Svargaloka, Maharloka, Janaloka, Tapaloka, and Satyaloka, which is Lord Brahma's abode. So there are all these Lokas, and this chart is there in the Gita PDX folder. You can, you can go and download it, have a look at it. Uh, I know it might be hard to look at it on the, on the screen sharing. So it's, it's available to you through that Google Drive. And uh, in Svargaloka, there is, that is the highest plane that one can achieve 
by by material pious activities okay so however much pious activities you do at a material level then one attains the swargaloka which is the place of tremendous enjoyment and at the swargaloka level it is very hard to do devotional service you just do your enjoyment the purpose of swargaloka is for you to go on a vacation because you earned a lot of money so to say in that analogy and now you just go spend it but if one has done spiritual practices then he can go but he has been unsuccessful and he could take birth like we read in the 6th chapter on the earth planet in a pious family in a family of transcendentalists or one could also go higher in the mahar loka jana loka tap loka at very very high levels of spiritual advancement one can go into those planes or those planetary levels as well uh, and from there one can make a uh, progress into the spiritual world but from swarga loka it is not possible to make progress into the spiritual world because the swarga loka is full of sense enjoyment and when there is so much sense enjoyment the the impetus or the inspiration to focus on devotional service does not take place that is why it is said that even the devatas many 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 of whom reside at the swarga loka level are waiting for their pious credits to be uh, to be drawn out to be uh, to be finished so that they can come back to the earth planet and then try and make spiritual progress so that is the reason why that is said um i will i will talk about this a little bit more in the next few verses when i talk about cosmic uh, devastation and uh, we will we'll come back to this chart so i'm going to stop sharing and uh, and come here okay so okay let me let me show this portion of the purport by shrila prabhupad so again i am on veda base here i go to bhagavad gita chapter 8 and i am on verse number 16 right now we we haven't started with 17 yet so this is the portion i was referring to um those who progress in krishna consciousness on the higher planets are gradually elevated to higher and higher planets and at the time of universal devastation are transferred to the eternal spiritual kingdom so those that are making progress and have reached all the way to the highest planets in the material world at the time of devastation cosmic devastation which we will talk about now they get transferred into the spiritual world or the spiritual kingdom so uh, i'll stop sharing again and now we will start today's class at verse number 17 so verse number 17 and 18 and uh, 19 as well are talking about the cosmic time scale and the how the cosmos works in cycles how the cosmos gets created how it is destroyed what happens to the living entities during the time of destruction and what is this whole uh, cycle of cosmic creation and destruction that is occurring what is the time scale of that how much time it takes uh, what's the time period of this whole cycle uh, to 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 speak in scientific terms that whole thing will be covered in three verses so please remember that bhagavad gita is very concise it's very coded uh, it's giving all the principles as i say uh, and i truly mean it when i say that that all the knowledge is present in bhagavad gita but bhagavad gita is just 700 verses and it's not possible to compress everything in detail in these 700 verses so in the shrimad bhagavatam there in the second canto third canto uh and many other places this whole cycle 
of creation and destruction has been described in detail. So Srimad Bhagavatam is the expanded version, so to say, of the Bhagavad Gita. So with that, let's read 8.17 and um, 8.18. I'll read all three and then we will we'll come back and, and look at it. So 8.17, it says, by human calculation, a thousand ages taken together from the form the duration of Brahma's one day. And such also is the duration of his night. So I'll come back and do the Sanskrit later. So I'm just going to read the three verses, the English translations. So the uh, age of, or the time span of one day of Brahma has been described, which is a thousand ages taken together is one, one day and the same amount is one night. I will explain what is the meaning of an age. At the next uh, verse 18, at the beginning of Brahma's day, all living entities become manifest from the unmanifest state. Okay, so at when the day of Brahma starts, the living entities you have to imagine are in some kind of unmanifest state. When the day begins, all the living entities become manifest. They come into existence into some um, tangible form. Unmanifest means they're in some kind of an abstract form. Manifest means something that you can touch and feel, something tangible. So these living entities come into the manifest state from the unmanifest state. And thereafter, when the night falls, they are merged into the unmanifest again. And when night occurs, Brahma's night, that is the time of destruction. So the universe gets destroyed, okay? At the time of Brahma's night. And then the living entities become unmanifest, okay? Because the universe, the material universe is getting destroyed. The living entities have to go somewhere and they go into an unmanifest state. And in text 19, Lord Krishna is saying again and again, when Brahma's day arrives, all living entities come into being and with the arrival of Brahma's night, they are helplessly annihilated. So on like this, the cycle keeps going every day of Brahma and every night of Brahma. So these are the three verses which are describing the time scale and the um, creation and destruction of the universe. So now I'm going to provide more details about it. And some of these or many of these are, are I'm picking up from the purports of Srila Prabhupada. I'm going to summarize and some of them I'm going to take extra details from Srimad Bhagavatam and share with you. So I'll go back to 17. Sahasra Yuga Paryantam. So Sahasra, as you all know, means 1000. And yuga is the age that Srila Prabhupada uh, used in the translation, a thousand ages, sahasra yuga. So this yuga <clears throat> is being called as age. What is this yuga? Yuga is a collection uh, or to be, uh, to just give you a number, yuga is four million, four, roughly 4.3 million years. That is the age or that's the time scale of one yuga. Okay, 4.3 million years. Uh, this one yuga is also known as a uh, maha yuga or a yuga cycle because this one yuga cycle comprises of four parts. And these four parts you might have heard more often. Satyuga, Treta yuga, Dwapar yuga and Kali yuga. So all four combined form one Mahayuga cycle, which is being called as yuga over here. And 1000 such yuga cycles are one day of Brahma. Okay, does that make sense? So what is the age of uh, Satyuga, Treta Yuga, Dwapar Yuga and Kali Yuga? Kali Yuga is 432,000 years. 
So I let me screen share again, and I have a another thing that I wanted to. Um, this all is also there in a very nice. Somebody made a nice chart. Vedic time periods. Do you see this? Uh, this thing here, this yeah, file, Vedic time periods. And this is what I'm showing you is in the Gita PDX folder as well. Can you check uh, parallelly if it's there in the Gita PDX folder? Vedic time periods dot PDF. I'm just showing you from my local drive and but it's there in the Gita PDX as well. I have put it. So um, let's see. Yeah. Hmm? It's there. Okay. So if you see here, there is Kali Yuga over here. If you see where I'm moving my mouse, Kali Yuga, 432,000 years. Okay. Then Dwapar Yuga is twice that, which is the Yuga that precedes Kali Yuga. So it's 864,000 years. Treta Yuga is three times that of Kali Yuga. And if you do the calculation, it will come to 1.296 million years. And Satyuga is four times Kali Yuga, and it comes to 1.728 million years. So that is the duration. Satyuga is much four times longer than Kali Yuga. And if you add all these up, you will come to 4.32 million years. Uh, it should be written somewhere here. Yeah, right here. One. Chatur Yuga cycle is, which is these four sub yugas is 4.32 million years. That is one yuga cycle, one Chatur Yuga cycle. And 1000 such cycles make up one day of Brahma. So if you see here one Kalpa that is known as one day of Brahma. Are you seeing my mouse here as I'm moving it here somewhere to the top left side? One kalpa is 1,000 such cycles. So obviously, if you multiply 4.32 million by 1,000, you get 4.32 billion. Million becomes billion if you multiply by 1,000. So that is the daytime of Brahma. And such is the time of his night as well, which means it will become 8.64 billion years is one full cycle of Brahma. Brahma's day or day plus night, 8.64 billion years, okay? And Brahma, that is just one day of Brahma, okay? And right now what is being shown here is 71 Chatur Yugas, just ignore that. I will explain it in a second what that means, but just ignore this 71 Chatur Yugas in the middle. So one day, plus one night is 8.64 billion years. So every day, the universe undergoes creation by Brahma. And at the end of, it, end of the night, it undergoes destruction. But this is partial destruction. This is not a complete destruction of the universe. At the night, he just you know unsettles everything. And when the day comes, he recreates everything, Brahma. Brahma himself is not immortal. He also has a life and he lives for 100 years where each year has 360 days. That makes it 36,000 days. Does that make sense? 100 years where each year is 360 days. So it becomes 36,000. 360 multiplied by 100 is 36,000. So he lives for 36,000 days. And each day, when I say day, I mean the whole cycle of day plus night. And so Brahma's lifetime in our solar years, if I do the math, I'll, I'll pull up my calculator here, uh, is 36,000 times 4.32 billion. Well, let me write it as 4.32 billion. So 4.320 million. So one, two, three, one, two, three. So this is 4.32 billion years is his one day. 
times two. So actually it should be, I'll make it 864. 8640000000. Okay, so that's his entire day plus night times 36,000 because that's how many days he lives, 100 years. And if I do equals, it comes to 311 trillion years. That's his entire lifetime. That's how long he lives by our when I say year, this means our years, our solar years. 311 trillion years is his lifetime of Brahma. Now you can imagine how vast these time scales are. We live for 100 years at most, if we are lucky in Kali Yuga. Brahma by comparison lives for 311 trillion years. So we, our life is like a blip, is like not even a blip in the lifetime of Brahma. That's how insignificant we at the earth planet are according to the Vedic science. So at the end of his life, when Brahma dies at the end of 311 trillion years, the whole universe is destroyed then that is called as a full destruction. At the end of every day of Brahma is a partial destruction. When his life ends, that is a full destruction of the whole universe. Now, let me tell you the most important thing. This whole universe, it is said in the Vedas, in the Srimad Bhagavatam, is coming out with each breath of Mahavishnu. As Mahavishnu, who is who we had talked about Karano Dakshai Vishnu, Garbho Dakshai Vishnu, and Kshiro Dakshai Vishnu. Lord Vishnu from the spiritual world enters the material world as Mahavishnu or Karano Dakshai Vishnu. And universes are coming out of his body with each breath. And when he inhales, they all go back in. That one breath of Mahavishnu, who is eternal, he has no lifetime, no end, he is eternal. He is immortal. So Lord Vishnu's each breath is this one lifetime of Brahma. So now you can also see how unimaginable is Lord Vishnu. The one that descends into the material world. And the time scales are mind boggling, are completely mind boggling. Okay, so that is uh, what I wanted to share with you regarding the time scales. At the end of every day of Brahma, a partial destruction of the universe takes place. And when I say partial destruction, destruction what is explained in the Shastras is that everything up to Swarga Loka is destroyed. Mahar Loka, Tapa Loka, Jana Loka and Satya Loka, they are not destroyed. But everything all the way until Swarga Loka is destroyed. So Indra, who is the king of Swarga, meets his death at the end of the day of Brahma. His lifetime is just the daytime of Brahma. Okay. So he is obviously has a much smaller lifetime than Brahma, but a much, much longer lifetime than we on the human planet or the Bhu Loka on the earth planet. So this everything from Swarga Loka downwards gets destroyed. That is known as partial destruction. And during that partial destruction, this is what was being said in the next verse of the Bhagavad Gita, 8.18. All the living entities that were there in Swarga Loka, Bhuvar Loka and Bhu Loka and all the way down, they enter into the body of Garbhodakshai Vishnu. They enter into Garbhodakshai Vishnu's body. Now it doesn't mean they attain spiritual liberation. They just enter into his body as a resting place. And I will show a portion of Srila Prabhupada's purport where uh, 
uh, where where he has mentioned that in in the purport of 8.19 but uh, they all enter there as a temporary resting place and when the day of brahma arrives those living entities are automatically it's not like they have a choice no i want to stay within lord vishnu's body i don't want to go no they don't have a choice they must go out and live their you know go through their cycle of of birth and death according to their past karma according to their desires all those things they have to go and continue their cycle of birth and death now when the whole now this is when the partial destruction occurs when the whole universe is destroyed still it is not that the living entities go to the spiritual world whether you like it or not like you know in india in government offices you have promotion after 5 years you will get promoted whether do you did anything or not that's at least you know how my father used to explain it you know we we all everybody knew where, at which grade level they will end up at retirement because it's like every 5 years you get promoted whether you do any work it's not meritocracy based and uh, you know so this system of going up to the spiritual world is highly meritocracy based meritocracy in terms of spiritual progress so it's not like if you didn't do any spiritual progress you will go to the spiritual world even if the whole universe is destroyed then those living entities take shelter in the body of mahavishnu they enter the body of mahavishnu and stay there and when another universe so this is what i was telling earlier this is karuno dakshai or mahavishnu and universes are coming out of his body with every breath and they are going back in with every breath they are coming out and going back in and that whole process of coming out and going back in that is the lifetime of the whole universe in our calculation that is 311 trillion years but that is just one breath of mahavishnu and the living entities take shelter in the body of mahavishnu and they come out in another universe <coughs> to continue their cycle so this is how the living entities continue to remain trapped in the material world and uh, from one uh, universe to the other they keep traveling forever like this until they make spiritual progress and go to the spiritual world which is described in the upper portions of this chart so that is what has been described here i will uh, stop the sharing and we will go back to the verses and look at some key points okay and if you have any questions if you didn't understand anything or something please post your questions in the chat we will take some questions after we cover these three verses so sahasra yuga paryantam i am going back to 8.17 sahasra yuga paryantam ahar yad brahmano viduhu ratrim yuga sahasrantam te ahol ratra vidojanah so um the translation is by human calculation a thousand ages taken together sahasra yuga form the duration of brahma's day and such is the duration of his night as well ratrim yuga sahasra antam so that's thousand ages duration is also the ratri the night time for brahma then the next verse at the beginning of brahma's day all living entities become manifest from the unmanifest state and thereafter when night falls they are merged into the unmanifest state again and as i said this unmanifest state is in the body of garbho dakshai vishnu and the sanskrit words used here is avyaktad vyakta uh, vyaktah sarvah so avyaktad vyaktayah sarvah so avyakta means unmanifest and vyakta means manifest so those words are important and i'll i want to explain one more thing avyakta here does not mean merging into the supreme brahman that is usually called as the uh, avyakta uh, this word avyakta will come at other places in the bhagavad gita where it is mentioned it is ref, being referred to as 
this brahman or the brahma jyoti now this brahma jyoti is in the spiritual realm okay however here the word avyakta is not referring to this spiritual realm or this brahman realization which one attains after successfully completing the process of gyana yoga gyana yoga we had learnt in the previous chapters so when one successfully completes the process of gyana then one attains this brahman realization or merges into this brahma jyoti and at several places in the bhagavad gita or at least a few places that is known also as is being referred to as avyakta whereas this avyakta is not that so one should not consider that one gets a free ticket to this brahman realization like or do anything good or not you will get avyakta you will become you will merge into the brahman that is incorrect why that is incorrect is being described in the next verse which is number 19 and uh number 19 says again and again okay th- sorry that is in 20 so let we have not done that one yet so um we'll cover 19 again and again when brahma's day arrives all the living entities come into being and with the arrival of brahma's night they are helplessly and highlighted and helplessly is important here automatically the word there is avashaha avashaha means automatically ratri agame avashaha partha at night they have to get and highlighted and when the day comes automatically they enter back so this automatically is important it's not like the living entities have a choice okay so 8.20 now lord krishna is going into the spiritual direction now in 8.20 he is saying that yet there is another unmanifest nature now he is talking about the brahman this unmanifest nature the spiritual nature which starts at the brahma jyoti level or the brahman level and he says there is yet there is another unmanifest nature which is eternal and is transcendental to this manifest and unmanifested matter so in the previous verses the manifest and unmanifest that was described is at a material level and there is another type of unmanifest which is spiritual and to that the translation continues it is supreme and it is never annihilated the other unmanifest that is the brahman or the spiritual nature when all this world is annihilated that part remains as it is so when this material world is completely annihilated the spiritual world remains and the beginning of the spiritual world is this brahman or the brahma jyoti so one must be very clear that there is a unmanifest nature within the material world and there is unmanifest nature of the spiritual world as well unmanifest in material terms so the sanskrit there is very important one must pay very careful attention paras tasmat so paras paras means beyond or transcendental so paras tasmat means to that which has been described so far in the previous verses tasmat to bhavo anyo so there is something else anyo means another so there is another bhava another nature which is paras transcendental to what has been described so far and the manifest and unmanifest the vyakta and avyakta has already been described in the previous verses so there is something transcendental to that vyakta and avyakta and what is that vyakto anya to vyakta avyakta different from vyakta and anvyakta which is sanatanaha so the sanskrit goes like paras tasmat to bhavo anyo vyakto avyaktat sanatanaha that which is eternal sanatan means eternal that has no beginning no end so this uh spiritual nature is being called as sanatana which is transcendental to this vyakta and avyakta of the material world yah sa sarveshu bhuteshu nash uh, nashyatsu na vinashyati so 
when all that is destroyed yahasa sarveshu bhuteshu nashyatsu when all this sarveshu bhuteshu all this material world sarveshu bhuteshu this material manifestation nashyatsu when it is destroyed na vinashyati that one which is being referred to as the sanatana is not destroyed na vinashyati so here lord krishna is saying that this material world which is comprised of the manifest and unmanifest matter meets its destruction but beyond all this there is a spiritual world which is completely eternal and does never gets destroyed na vinashyati so now 8.21 and 22 lord krishna is going to these are very very important verses 21 and 22 where lord krishna is connecting the whole topic back to uh that one should aim for going to the spiritual world the eternal world not staying in this material world okay so one should uh so let's look at that and if you remember in the verses prior in the 18th in the sorry the 8th chapter lord krishna was speaking about the param purusha kavim puranam anushasitaram that person paramam purusham was being mentioned the paramatma form that the dhyana yogis apply their mind to that form was being described here in these verses he will say that that form is none other than me as well so he will connect it back to him so let's see these two beautiful verses and then we will take some questions so text 21 so let me see if there are uh, any things that i wanted to cover from the purports so far ah so i forgot to mention about those manus those 71 cycles i will cover that as part of the q and a or maybe at the later at later at the towards the end um and there are some other points i think uh, that's okay let me let me cover this so 8.21 very very important verse so lord krishna is saying here that which the vedantists describe as unmanifest and infallible that's the spiritual world now that's the unmanifest being talked about here that which is known as the supreme destination that place from which having attained it one never returns that is my supreme abode so that whole thing that was being described so far that supreme person the destination where we should aim to go all that thing that was being described lord krishna says that is nothing else but it is my supreme abode which means that that destination and lord krishna's destination are one and the same and that paramam purusham is none other than lord krishna himself so let's see this avyakto akshara ityak uktash तम आहु परमाम गतिम यम प्राप्य न निवर्तन्ते तद् धाम परमम मम सो द ट्रांसलेशन और द वर्ड बाय वर्ड गोस लाइक अव्यक्तो अक्षर सो दिस अनमैनिफेस्ट अव्यक्त नाउ दिस अव्यक्त वर्ड इज कमिंग अगेन बट दिस अव्यक्त इज अक्षर अव्यक्त द नेक्स्ट वर्ड इज अक्षर व्हिच मींस इटर्नल और इनफैलिबल सो दैट इज द अव्यक्त व्हिच इज बीइंग रेफर्ड हियर So, अव्यक्त अक्षर इति उक्तस तम आहु दैट इज नोन एज द परमाम गतिम दैट इज द दैट इनफॉलेबल वर्ल्ड दैट इटर्नल वर्ल्ड दैट स्पिरिचुअल वर्ल्ड व्हिच इज नोन एज द परमाम गतिम दैट वन कृष्णा इज सेइंग व्हाट इज दैट वन दैट वन इज एंड व्हाट इज अनदर प्रॉपर्टी ऑफ इट yam prapya na nivartante after going there no one returns that one which is that one in the last uh, quartlet this 8.21d lord krishna is connecting that that one is what tad dham paramam mama mama means mine that par, dha, paramam dhamam is my dham 
that is the spiritual world so this completes the whole connection that he is the spiritual purush the paramam purusha and that tad dhamam or that paramam dhamam is krishna's abode tad dhamam paramam mama this he also says in 15.6 15.6 the 15th chapter basically is a summary of all the vedas all the learnings taken directly from the vedas the four vedas are summarized in the 15th chapter so in the 15th chapter also this verse exact same line comes 15.6 um also says tad dhamam paramam mama that supreme abode of mine is not illuminated by the sun or the moon nor by fire or electricity those who reach it never return to this material world so that i was reading the translation of 15.6 so there the nature of the spiritual world is being described that that spiritual world does not is not illuminated by the sun or the moon or by fire or by any kind of other energy that whole spiritual world runs by the energy emanating out of krishna krishna is the source of all energy so krishna supplies the energy it's the energy coming out of krishna so that's what he is describing that in the spiritual world that tad dhamam paramam mama that place which does not need the sun or the moon or any other source of illumination except for me that is my spiritual abode and it is the paramam dhamam it's the highest destination there is no destination higher than that okay so we completed till 8.21 um now finally krishna says he goes back to the 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 purusha description of himself and he says the supreme personality of godhead who is greater than all is attained by unalloyed devotion though although he is present in his abode he is all pervading and everything is situated within him this is 8.22 so this concludes this description of the material world and lord krishna says that one should try to go to the spiritual world and the way to go to the spiritual world is by unalloyed devotion so the sanskrit is purusha sah para parah partha bhaktya labhyasyatva anyaya ananyaya so again the word ananyaya is coming yasya antah sthani bhutani yena sarvam idam tatam so by bhaktya labhyasyatva ananyaya so that purusham purusham sah parah partha that supreme purusham parah purusham that is purusha sa parah parah means the supreme person which krishna has already said is me that purusha how is he obtained bhaktya labhyastva anan ananyaya by ananya bhakti by exclusive bhakti one can attain labhyasya labhyas means to obtain so one can obtain this paramam purusha parah purusha through labhya through ananya bhakti and then the characteristics of the param Pur param purusham is described as that he is all pervading and everything is situated in him so that uh, kind of completes the overall section 8.22 and the the main point of this whole description is that everything in the material world is temporary everything from this world up all the way to brahma loka is temporary it may have a very long life too many zeros for us to count 311 trillion years may be the life of uh, brahma we have a very tiny life but even brahma's life is nothing but a simple breath of lord vishnu so everything including brahma is temporary in this material world and has a death or an ending it has a finite lifetime and our goal should be to attain the spiritual world which is eternal which is sanatanah 
after going there, nobody comes back to this material world. So the emphasis is that don't try to go up in this material world to the higher planets. Time will fly. Time, you will never know how the time flew, how, how quickly one becomes, even in this world, even though, I mean, 100 years is a pretty long time. And, and there are people who live that long uh, or 80 years, 90 years, whatever. If you ask such a person, he will say, my life went so fast. I wish I could live, live it all again. Nobody wants to get old. Nobody wants to die. And as parents, we can see, you know, just it feels as if it was yesterday when our children were born. And now they are, you know, big uh, adults. So always, even though by numbers, it looks like so many years, it still is a very, very short period of time. And similarly, on the Swargaloka, on the heavenly planets, or in Brahmaloka even, or anywhere in between, even though it may appear to be a long life, a lot of zeros may be there in the number, but time will fly very fast and one will never be satisfied with this long life. So one should not aim to add few more years to his life by going to the higher planets, by doing, you know, by doing things that are other than material, uh, other than spiritual, uh, spiritually oriented. By simply doing material activities and staying in this material world end of the day, we will get frustrated. We will feel that, oh, we wanted more. That's it. It's the end. Hmm, too bad. I wanted more. That feeling will always be there. So one should always try to, the message here is to go to the spiritual world. And everything in this material world is temporary. Everything is temporary and will come to an end. So once again, to summarize it, Krishna is eternal, material world is temporary. So one must focus on Krishna. If one focus on the, focuses on the material world, then the result will be misery. Sooner or later, the result will be misery. So one should focus your mind on Krishna throughout your lifetime. And if you focus during your life, on Krishna, then you can remember Krishna even at the time of death. So the way to remember Krishna at the time of death is to remember Krishna during one's life. Now, let me ask a question, a rhetorical question. So some will say, which is more important to remember Krishna during the life or to remember Krishna at the time of death? If you can do only one of the two, let's say you cannot do both. If you remember Krishna during your life, let's say I'm telling you that you can't, you won't remember him at the time of death. That's choice number one. Or the second choice is you don't remember Krishna during your life. And somehow by magic, like Ajamila story that I shared with you from Srimad Bhagavatam sixth canto, somehow magically you can remember Krishna at the time of death. Let's say. Which one should you choose? So those who uh, say choice number one, could you raise your hands? And you can use the Zoom feature to raise your hand if you would like. Okay. I see a lot of people raising their hands. Okay. How about, okay, I'll wait for a few more seconds. Okay, great. A lot of people raised their hands. How many of you would go for this? So let me clear them all. I'm going to clear. How many of you would go for the second option? Okay. Okay, I'm going to clear all. So not many, just a few people raise their hand. And that's the right answer. This first one is the right answer. Why is that? 
why should we focus more on remembering Krishna during our life rather than somehow hoping that we will remember Krishna at the end of our life? For, there are two answers to this or two reasons for this. The first reason is that if we don't remember Krishna during our life, it's going to be very hard for us to remember Krishna at the end of our life and truly only some uh, miracle can, uh, you know, very, very unlikely miracle can cause us to remember Krishna at the end of our life if we have not focused on him throughout our life. So we are trying to pin our hopes on a miracle to occur. And the other reason is that if we remember, if we are devoted to Krishna throughout our life, he will make sure that we can remember him at the end of our life. So by doing the first, we are guaranteeing the second. And even if we cannot remember him, he will still take us back, take his devotees back to the spiritual world with his own hands. So really remembering Krishna at the end of our life is almost a outcome rather than a cause, rather than something that we need to cause from our side. That's more of an outcome. An outcome of the fact that whether we have remembered Krishna during our life or not. So that is by far the most important thing that we should focus on in our life. And I will uh, um, speak a little bit more about it uh, in the in the later verses. 8.27 and, and uh, 28. So at this point, I'll, let me see if there are any questions. Hmm, there's a one very long question. Um, I'm bad at reading long questions during uh, while I'm online. So let me see. So one question is about Lord Shiva and other gods in heaven. So Lord Shiva is not residing in heaven. If you saw that chart that I showed you, Lord Shiva is a spiritual uh, person. He's a spiritual personality. So he lives in the spiritual world. Of course, he descends into the material world. Um, but in the spiritual world, he is known as Sadashiva. And that Sadashiva is completely is, is completely eternal. He does not have a ending of, of the life. So that's the answer to that. Other gods, I don't know which other gods are being referred to here, but all the demigods, the Devis and Devatas, they I don't know the exact lifetimes, but depending on who they are, they have a finite life at most the life of Brahma. Lord Brahma is the one that has the maximum life in the material world. So all the Devis and Devatas who are situated in the material world have a lifetime not exceeding the life of Brahma. That's, some, that's something we can say. I don't know which Devis, Devatas, which demigods are being asked about uh, here, but uh, uh, it'll, you know, depend on that. Okay. So this long question, uh, let me try and read it. I was listening to Srila Prabhupada recently and I came across below information on krishna.org. I started chanting Hare Krishna mantra for 30 minutes to one hour every day. This is excellent. This is absolutely excellent. Thank you for doing this. But is it necessary to chant 16 rounds of Hare Krishna mantra every day? No, that is not necessary in the beginning stages. But... Uh, our acharyas and specifically Srila Prabhupada has said, now this is a, I'll say something which is at a spiritual level. So try and try and, you know, understand it in that sense. Acharyas are the ones who are allowed or empowered by Lord Krishna to set certain guidelines and set certain rules. And because 
they have been empowered by Lord Krishna. Lord Krishna accepts that whatever rules they have that have been set by the Acharyas, Lord Krishna is aligned with those rules because he is the one who has empowered them to make the rules. So it's like the king, if he has empowered his minister, okay, you go and, you know, set whatever rules, or let's say you set how much tax you have to collect, 20%, 30%, whatever. He's giving the empowerment to the minister. The minister looks at all the situation of the citizens, does the calculation, we need this much expenses, we need this much income, and he sets a tax rate, 30% or 20%, whatever it is. The king agrees, he trusts his ministers that they must have done the calculation, whatever they have done, fine. Now the king says, everybody must, whoever has paid 20% tax is fine. Whoever has not paid, we will prosecute him. So the king empowers the ministers, the ministers make the rules, and then this is how the thing functions. So in the same way, in the spiritual life, acharyas come and prescribe various rules. So Srila Prabhupada has said that if you are chanting 16 rounds of Hare Krishna mantra every day, then that is sufficient to go back to the spiritual world after this lifetime. But one must sincerely chant 16 rounds every day. And especially after taking initiation, taking shelter of a guru, of a bona fide guru, and uh, taking a vow of chanting 16 rounds of Hare Krishna mantra every day, if you do that, and also he has said, following the regulative principles of goodness, which are no meat eating, no gambling, no uh, illicit sex, and no intoxication. So following all these rules and chanting sincerely with full uh, ananya manasa, with, with very focused mind on Krishna, chanting 16 rounds, if you do this, very nicely, for this lifetime, spiritual world is guaranteed. So this is the promise that Srila Prabhupada has made. He has been empowered by Krishna and he has given us these rules. And if we follow those rules, at the end of this life, we can go back to the spiritual world. So is it necessary to chant 16 rounds every day? Uh, up to you. I have told you, I have, uh, you know, what Srila Prabhupada has said. So yes, if you are serious about making spiritual progress in this life, please take up chanting 16 rounds and gradually you increase. You don't have to do it, start it overnight. Gradually start with one round, two rounds, five rounds, 10, like that, but quickly try to come to the stage of chanting 16 rounds. And then at the end of this very life, one can get liberation. Is celibacy required in spirituality? No, celibacy is not required. But one must have, it's, it's encouraged, like we said in one of the previous classes. Um, it's encouraged to have children because you're begetting devotee children. But, um, so celibacy is not required, but Union is required within the institution of marriage, not outside the institution of marriage. Um, so here is the information on krishna.org. If we want to be successful in chanting of Hare Krishna mantra, it is essential that we come to the platform of offenseless chanting. That's what I said, very focused, sincere chanting and offenseless is, is kind of included in that. And there are some rules also specified what it means by offenseless we will go into that some other time we don't have time right now to go into it but for now suffice to say with very very focused mind chant the Hare Krishna mantra actually in the beginning we cannot chant the Hare Krishna mantra purely that's absolutely correct till today I am not able to do that as well I can tell you that I myself see that how how many faults, how many flaws, how many mistakes I make. Actually, uh, so there will be many offenses for sure, correct? 
the only way to overcome these offenses actually is by chanting hare krishna hare krishna 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 hare 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 ram hare ram 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 hare hare at least 16 rounds a day every day without fail also we must strictly follow the four regulative principles like i said no illicit sex no meat eating no gambling no intoxication if we are thinking that we can make any advancement in krishna consciousness without coming to the platform of chanting at least 16 rounds of hari krishna mantra and strictly following the regulative principles we are simply deluding ourselves there is no spiritual life without following these principles only useless sentiment so is there a question so this is like copy pasted from that website so is the what is the question is the question that okay is it completely useless either it is all or nothing i think that's the question is that correct so shilpa yes that is what my question is and my second question is you know like the the first point like the on the offenses you know it mentioned that you know like uh, the sex inside in the marriage is also considered illicit if we if uh, you know like if it's not done for producing children so my question is also that if you can elaborate a little bit on that as well yeah so so that is correct and let me um it's it's a difficult question given that there are you know younger children and everything on this call as well so let me see how i can answer it best in the best possible way but the first question is uh, is also equally important i think so what is mentioned on the website is i, I don't want to contradict it but it's a little uh, harsh it's it's a little strong where it says that there is no spiritual life without following this prince these principles only useless sentiment so that's a little harsh or or, or strict like we read in bhagavad gita in the end of 6th chapter even if you make spiritual progress but not complete it are not fully successful then the next life you continue from there and depending on what progress what kind of progress the amount of progress that you have made in this life the the situation of the next life is governed or is determined by that so uh at least a human life is definitely guaranteed if a certain level of spiritual progress has been made what this may be referring to and i will go back and look exactly the sort of something the before it afterwards and and try to find the context sometimes we we may understand things uh out of context or 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 kind of take a sentence all by itself uh what this could mean where it is being called as a useless sentiment as as in like completely useless is if we are doing it completely offensively which means doing it as a show simply in the mind what is going on is is whatever materialistic things to to look good to uh to others to show off to others with with absolutely no devotion in our heart and it's completely a show business so still you are one is doing but internally the desires are fully material i want to look good i want to be proud i want to dominate over so and so person or whatever may be the reason lord chaitanya in fact in the chaitanya charitamrita says that even in this kind of situation even if done offensively there is still some benefit so you are making some forward progress which probably is being called as completely useless or it is close to useless but it is still in the positive direction so lord krishna is very merciful if you take his name even if it is uh, offensive even if it is uh, um uh, not taken with full heart it is still useful i would say that so i would not call it completely useless i don't know what it means by useless sentiment but it's at, at least it is not completely useless there is definite benefit in that how much benefit that is uh, you know depends on the quantity the sincerity the seriousness by which one is taking the name of krishna okay um on the other question that you had yes um sex in marriage 
if it is not for producing children, what is the reason for that? There is, has to be some other motive or motivation or objective. The objective there is sense gratification or sensual sense gratification. So that is the same as indulging or uh, um, going for some other kind of sense gratification. There are considered to be other pleasures which are more gratifying, more sense, uh, sense gratifying or sensual gratifying than uniting with the opposite gender. They are considered to be uh, the, num the number of people, the, the power, the fame, the ahankar, the one, the things that fuel that are even more stronger forms of sense gratification than uniting with the opposite gender. So um, um, all these kind of sense gratifications are, um, not, are not conducive for making spiritual progress, all of them. Now, when one is uniting with the opposite gender for the sake of begetting children, there has to be some kind of uh, notion of sense gratification. Srila Prabhupada says that in the Bhagavad Gita that some little bit of sense gratification desire has to be there. Otherwise, it is not possible for the union to occur. And that is okay. As long as the result is to have children and with the intent, not with the intent of, okay, I'll just produce children and I'll just leave them in the orphanage or you know, put them up for adoption or not take care of them. As long as the intent is that if Krishna blesses us with a child, I will take care of the child and try to make the child into a devotee of Krishna. With that intent, with one, one can unite with the opposite gender. And to do that, some desire, external desire for sense gratification has to be there. Otherwise, it is not going to be possible. And that's okay. That is permitted. Okay. So hopefully that answers the, your question to some extent, Sushil Pamadaji. Yeah, yeah, it does. Thank you. Okay. The universe, okay, this is a question by Priyam Rastogi. The universe shown in the image is equivalent to modern science universe. Okay, this is a great question and um, kind of my favorite topic to talk about also. So let me spend a couple of minutes um, talking about this. So, uh, let me share my screen again. Okay. So here again, we are seeing this uh, material world and we are seeing these universes coming out of the body of Mahavishnu. And it's uh, more since the shading is kind of between Mahavishnu and the universe, you see this shading here. It, the, 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 the picture is giving a, a feeling that the universes at this moment are coming out. Like when a jet flies in the sky, it leaves a jet stream behind it. So the jet stream tells you the, uh, the previous path of the jet, correct? So in the same way, you can see these kind of shades and the universes are, it seems, coming out at this time. So which means that Lord Mahavishnu has exhaled right now and the universes are coming out. And in modern science, one of the things that we have is this notion of the expanding universe. Okay, there was this originally this uh, theory of a steady state universe. And a lot of scientists came up with a lot of theories about a steady state universe. Even uh, Einstein, when he came up with his theory of general relativity and cosmology and everything, his equations predicted an expanding universe. The math, most of the progress in physics, by the way, happens due to mathematics. They do some mathematical calculations. These physicists, they are basically mathematicians. They do some calculations. They come up with an equation. Now they look at the equation and say, aha, this term is there in the equation. It must mean something in the physical world. 
this thing is there in the equation it must mean something in the physical world and then they are able to describe or predict aspects about the physical world then sometime later somebody actually finds such a thing in the physical world and then this guy gets a nobel prize ah he predicted it basically it's a math that they are doing and the 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 expression or the elements within the equation are related to physical aspects now when einstein did his equation of general relativity or something i don't you know the physicists on the call can can correct me he the equations predicted an expanding universe and the general theory or the general understanding at that time was of a steady state universe and he thought oh my god my equation must be wrong because everybody believes that the universe is static and he will he thought people will make fun of me he, they will tell that my equation is wrong so he inserted a what is known as a cosmological constant he inserted he artificially changed the equation which made it look as if this universe is steady state and everybody was happy okay yes einstein's equation is correct later on by uh, the discovery of edwin hubble hubble discovered that the universe is expanding and more recently towards the second half of this century a bunch of scientists led by a scientist by the name of shaul perlmutter he got a nobel prize a few years ago uh, discovered that not only the universe is expanding but it is expanding at a accelerated rate which means the expansion is increasing with time so the expansion itself is becoming faster and faster so there was no doubt that the universe is expanding then einstein said of course when hubble figured that out einstein said oh my god this cosmological constant that i artificially introduced was wrong and he removed it it is famously he called it the biggest blunder of my career so this is what is happening in modern science they you know big scientists also try to make the math fit the common belief rather than leave the math to say what it is even if we just believe math uh, or the mathematical structure of the universe some reality does come out of it anyhow our vedas the shrimad bhagavatam and the vedic science has been saying this a uh, model of the universe where the universes are coming out of mahavishnu now one of now one of the reasons uh, or one of the big questions in modern science today is what is feeding what is the energy that is feeding the expansion of the universe they don't know the answer to that yet they have no clue what is because everybody knows that if there is acceleration there has to be a force matter does not accelerate on its own everybody knows this matter left alone will go will stay at rest or move at constant velocity this is newton's first law matter stays at rest or moves at constant velocity it does not accelerate to accelerate you have force which is that famous equation force equals mass times acceleration so where is the force and they don't know that force and some energy has to provide the force force comes from energy some energetic source so what is providing the force they have no idea and they have given a place holder name for it called dark energy if you have heard this term dark energy it's just a place holder name they could have as well just called it mickey mouse or donald duck they just called it dark energy it's a place holder name we know now from this model of the universe the vedic model that energy is coming from mahavishnu and while he is exhaling his exhale now you can see when you blow out you you feel some pressure on your hand that is the force that is the energy that is coming from mahavishnu which is causing the expansion now one of the other things that scientists say is that the universe will continuously expand there are other scientists who have the model now they cannot explain why it will continuously expand will the expansion ever stop 
then they ask the question what if it's a cycle it expands and contracts expands and there's there is uh, something known as a big bang which started the expansion and everybody has probably heard of this big bang theory then they call something as the known as the big crunch which means the whole universe at some point will begin contracting and will become very small again and this theory is out of fashion these days the big crunch theory but from mahavishnu from the picture that we know we know that there will be a big crunch when mahavishnu will inhale like that he inhales then all the universes will start coming back in so this exhaling what they are uh what they are um observing right now as the accelerating expansion of the universe is because mahavishnu is right now exhaling which means he's putting the force and the universes are flying farther and farther apart at a faster rate and then when he inhales so so these are the things you know uh, with 100 years of our lifetime of a given scientist trying to predict what will happen in trillions of years is is a little hard you know you you're being asked to it's like you know you're being asked to look at a car on the street for one second and predict where it will go or something like that you know some analogy it's it's going to be very hard by its inherent nature of the problem because the time scales are so big so these are some of the you know but as you can see there is a very clear explanation of this possible source of dark energy which the scientists are still uh, uh grappling with even before that whoever was believing in the steady state theory of the universe can see from here that the steady state does not apply there is expansion and there is contraction now of course there are various aspects that the expansion is occurring within the universe all the galaxies are expanding within the universe here we are talking about the expansion of multiple universes itself so one has to you know probably the future scientists devotee scientists will somehow solve this problem or work on this problem i don't know god bless all those devotee scientists who will who will work on this in the future another point um you know and of course the steady state theory could have easily been uh, you know uh, talked about here the other point which i just wanted to make which went out of my mind mm, yes this there is this other theory of multiverse that is gaining ground multiverses and whether there is one universe or multiple universes now about 30 to 40 years ago or even 20 30 years ago this was a crazy idea to say that there are multiverses now that idea has been taking more and more uh, place and grounding in modern mainstream modern science there is this person in mit uh, alan guth he's a big professor at mit he's he's uh, one of the the top professors there of physics of theoretical physics and he came up with this or at least he was one of the people who was behind this theory of multiverse and you can see from this picture from the vedic science there's absolutely multiverses there is there's no question about it and they are spending their lives trying to prove or trying to come up with an answer whether there is multiverse or not of course it is there if you look at vedic science the answer is yes but of course they want to prove it in their own way with mathematics with with all the scientific tools they won't say that because bhagavatam says it that will be the last thing they will say that will be the most uh, um humiliating thing for them to say that because vedas say it that's why we are basing our deductions on it they will never say that they want to come up with the same conclusions but with their scientific process we we'll leave them to that process god bless them as well uh, hopefully they will come with the same conclusions and it's good it reinforces the validity of vedic science all the knowledge is present here they will take hundreds of years how many ever years to figure out the same answers they will learn the what we call as the hard way but as devotees we can put our faith in the vedas and we know that we can get these answers much sooner and in a more 
a clean and better way. We don't have to understand complex mathematics and spend a whole life learning math to come to the same conclusion which you can come by simply reading the Vedas. But again, God bless those modern scientists. God bless the devotee scientists. Hopefully they will all come to the same conclusion and it'll, they will happily live ever after. So does that, does that help? Does that, is that a you know, reasonable discussion on uh, the, this picture being equivalent to modern science? Priyam yes, yes, yes. Thank you, Prabhuji. Okay. I'm glad you asked it. I, I, I enjoyed talking about it. Okay, one more question privately to me is which year and day of Brahma are we on now? Okay, that's a good question. Uh, we are almost in the middle of Brahma's life. So let me go back to the other chart. So when I talked about like each Chatur Yuga cycle, are, am I still sharing the screen? Yeah, okay. So each Chatur Yuga cycle is 4.32 million years. And we said that there are 1000 such cycles, right? In a life, in a day of Brahma. So that makes it 4.32 billion years. Million becomes billion when you multiply by 1000. Now these uh, 1000 cycles, which include, now this is the daytime portion. There is equal amount of nighttime portion as well. The daytime portion is divided into 14 manvantaras, which means 14 periods of manus. A manu is like, a, you can think of like a, um, the main progenitor of life during that time period. So there are 14 manus during a day of Brahma or during these 1000 Chatur Yuga cycles. So if you do the math roughly and you divide 1000 cycles by 14 manus, one four, it comes to about 71. It's not exactly divisible because there is in the day of Brahma, there is some twilight, some dusk time and that accounts for the fractional time lost. Okay, so uh, we won't worry about the fractional time because it is considered, and those are the details, the dusk time, the twilight time, and the partial time used in the destruction and the creation, some time is needed for those activities as well. So that is how the, the whole calculation works. But 71 yoga cycles are there among, under one manu. And there are 14 manus. And if you multiply 14 by 71, you roughly get 1000. So there are 14 manus. That's the main point I wanted to say. And we currently are under the seventh manu among the 14. So in general, whoever asked the question, generally we are in the seventh manu period, which means we are in the about at the middle point of the life of Brahma or not life, the day of Brahma. And we know from the Shastras and our Acharyas have told that we are also in the middle of the life of Brahma. Not only in the middle of the current day of Brahma, but this day is occurring somewhere where Brahma is 50 years old. Okay, remember Brahma lives for 100 years. Each year is 360 days. That makes it 36,000 days. So we are somewhere around the 18,000th day. And on that day, we are somewhere in the middle because we are under the four, the seventh Manu and his name is Vaivashwata Manu. And if you remember in chapter four, the history of the Bhagavad Gita was described by Lord Krishna, where he said that I gave this knowledge to Vivishwan. Vivishwan is the... Um, uh, father of the Vaivashwata Manu and Vaivashwata Manu gave it to his son Ikshwaku Maharaj and that dynasty continued from there. So we are in the Vaivashwata Manu period and there are other Manus. The first Manu in this day of Brahma is Swayambhuva Manu and the other names have been given in Srimad Bhagavatam 8th Canto. If you search, you will find all the names of the 14 Manus, not the six that have come so far 
The seventh one is Vaivashvatamanu and the remaining seven that will come, all their names have been given in the Srimad Bhagavatam. The sixth Manu preceding to Vaivashvata Manu was Chakshusha Manu. And I forget the other names before. And the first one was, of course, Swayambhuva Manu. So, um, uh, so the short answer to that question, and I just used this question to describe this concept of the Manus and the Manvantara periods. Each Manus period is known as Manvantara, comprising of these 71 Chaturyuga cycles. So, we are somewhere in the middle. Uh, and here it is written, we are in the 28th Chaturyuga cycle of the seventh Manvantara. That is our current uh, time in, in the current time scale. That's where we are. That's also shown here in this chart. Okay, hopefully that answers the question, uh, Ravi Prabhu, that you asked. Yes, it does. Thank you, Prabhu. Thank you. Okay, next question. We'll run through it because then we will, you know, there, these are all great questions. We still have to complete some of the verses of the eighth chapter. So um, we'll, we'll move forward. Mm, if so, then why is it mentioned that there is only one son? Uh, you can ignore this question, Professor. Okay, fine. I, I didn't understand it very well either. So that's fine. Then how many times do you have to say Hare Krishna in one round? In one round, the whole mantra, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. This is one mantra. And this mantra has to be said 108 times. And that is called as one round. Okay. So if you have to take, say this mantra 108 times, and usually when we, I, I personally, when I do my chanting or my japa, the English name is chanting. In Sanskrit, it is known as japa. So when I do japa, each round takes me about six to seven minutes. So I go at a little faster speed. I don't go so slowly. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. At this speed, it would take about 10 minutes for one round, which would mean 160 minutes for 16 rounds, which is about two and a half hours. For me, it takes about one and a half hours or little more. And the speed I go with at is like this. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Like this, I go at this speed. It takes me about six to seven minutes. But the best place to practice doing the japa is with Srila Prabhupada. You can practice Japa along with Srila Prabhupada. And I think I had shown this uh, some time back. There is a very nice, so the disciples of Srila Prabhupada recorded Srila Prabhupada doing Japa. And a very good practice is for if you are doing Japa, turn on that uh, audio and you do your Japa along with him. And it's okay if you go a little bit at the same speed or a little slower speed or something like that. But that uh, will, will give you good grounding in your Japa along with Srila Prabhupada. Let me show you that uh, record that uh, YouTube video. Uh, I'm going to, am I sharing the screen? Not yet. Okay. So I'll go to YouTube and I'm going to into incognito mode so that I'm trying to emulate myself as you uh, because then, uh, you know, my, otherwise the videos that will be, you know, my, my, my search results will come faster because I search for these things all the time. Srila Prabhupada chanting Japa. See, that's the first link that came up and it's a 10 hour video. You can use this one, which is, uh, let's see, I, I, I'm not familiar with this one. I'm familiar with the second one. Can you hear the audio on my computer that's coming? No. No? No. I don't know. But anyway, you can see at least the video that I'm showing. You can see the same video. There's another one which is in the group setting. I think it is, yeah, this one. Prabhupada chanting Japa with group. 
this is the one that i am referring to hari krishna hari krishna 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 hari 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 ram hari ram 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 hari hari so this one you i know you can't hear it i can hear it on my computer yeah you can hear it but you can you can look at this video and chant along with shrila prabhupad this is a 3 hour video but you can you know chant for how many ever time long you want 20 minutes 30 minutes whatever you want to start with okay let's see what are the other questions um if lord brahma and and then the way to chant your japa is uh using beads so i have my japa beads here this is like the japa mala and this is the sort of the starting point this is known as the head bead which has a a little you know loop around it so this is the head bead and then there are 108 beads in this whole mala and each at each bead you say the whole maha mantra hare krishna hare krishna 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 hare 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 ram hare ram 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 hare hare then you go to the next bead hare krishna hare krishna 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 hare 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 ram hare ram 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 hare hare like that and when you come back to the circle you can feel this big bead is much bigger and it has this little loop at the top so you know that you have completed one round so like this you don't have to keep count you can just do the japa and the japa mala will tell you automatically when your round is over so this is how you can use the japa beads for doing japa and very soon in our class we will start doing japa we will dedicate the last 10 minutes of the class time to doing japa i have been doing this every single batch since many years and it yeah. gives people a good understanding a practical um, experience of doing japa someone should mute i think okay next question if lord brahma is the only god who lives the longest compared to all other gods and goddesses then how long does lord krishna live for okay uh, lord krishna is not a demigod that statement was for demigods lord krishna is the supreme lord he is spiritual so he 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 is not in that same it's not an apple to apple comparison okay i hope you are understanding um this correctly so lord krishna is not a demigod that statement was for a demigod which means devis and devatas the english translation that shila prabhupad uses for devi devatas is demigods lord krishna does not have a life he is eternal okay adir anadir govinda adi anadi he has no beginning and no end okay so i hope that question is answered then there is the question if we have made spiritual progress towards krishna krishna consciousness but have not completed it in the next life when we are born will we remember or how can we remember recollect how much spiritual progress we had done in our past life so that we can continue our progress and hopefully with full effort we can successfully reach krishna consciousness you had said during the cycle of birth and death the person won't and can't remember what they did in their past life so is there a way or strategy to remember or recollect it okay great question please review sixth chapter the last portion of sixth chapter looks like uh, that class you may have missed um veda varshini mata ji or prabhu ji so we had discussed this topic in great detail the answer is automatically without even you trying okay the if you look at the 6th chapter i'll tell you the specific verses to look at 6 point they would be 44 or 45 let me see yeah 44 if you see purva abhyasena taineva purva abhyasena by your prior practice of krishna consciousness it will automatically avashah you will see the word automatically being revived um purva abhyasena tainaeva 
dhriyate hi avasho pisaha and avasho is automatically so you don't have to worry now you may have seen children who are automatically very good at doing something who are automatically very good at singing automatically very good at you know you you sometimes say that oh maybe this is you know they are bringing it from their previous life or something like that devotional service automatically in the same way starts for you without you even doing anything about it you don't have to recollect you don't have to know your past life krishna will make the arrangement that you automatically start from where you left off please review the last portion of the 6th chapter we had covered in our class classes 6th chapter in two sessions so review the second session of the 6th chapter uh, either on youtube or the audio recordings that we post and and you will get a clear answer and you still have a doubt please ask the please ask your questions at that time is that clear veda varshini hello prabhu ji um yes i may have forgotten i was there for the class but i think i forgot about that specific part no problem you can go and review it okay yes i'll review it okay since next question since you spoke about the time period can you please advise what should be the geographical representation of australia region in sankalpam will it be different to bharat khande or mero he dakshine parshve can you please advise i'm not sure about these details i'll have to look up okay i'm not able to um answer this fully at this time i'll have to look up what these terms mean uh okay okay um okay we need to speed up so last question is is there only one universe that is created at the start of lord krishna's breath or are there multiple the answer is multiple also does a universe start and end with the same breath or does it last uh of the duration of multiple breaths i am trying to understand how parallel universes occur so all the universes come out at the exhalation time and go back into the body of mahavishnu at inhalation time okay so that is my understanding these are very complex topics of course you know to understand one simple thing one has to spend his whole lifetime trying to understand one very simple aspect of the material world of material nature these are very complex topics so my limited understanding is that multiple universes come out with the exhalation of mahavishnu and they all go back in into the um into mahavishnu there is a verse uh 9.456 uh, then 7th 7th 9.7th verse gives a little hint about this let me show you mm. am i still sharing the screen so we'll go to 9.9 and the 7th verse yes o son of kunti at the end of the millennium all material manifestations enter into my nature and at the beginning of another millennium by my potency i create them again so all material manifestations everything all the universes go in enter into my nature so here uh uh that is the 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 reference the only sort of point in the bhagavad gita where lord krishna is mentioning this point so we'll cover this when we come to the ninth chapter okay that's all the questions so one more question rud rudrak rudrak uh, rudraksh is very important so rudraksh is to do with lord shiva we usually and i think you're referring to the rudraksh mala we usually chant on tulsi mala so this uh, japa beads are made of tulsi wood uh, not out of, no, these are this is not the rudraksha mala okay so we have about 10 minutes and let's finish the chapter but we are mostly done with the most important part of the chapter now coming back to the eighth chapter so that was a wonderful q and a session thank you for for that uh for all those wonderful questions so we had covered till 8.22 so once again we are at the point in the 8th chapter where lord krishna is saying that you focus on me and if you desire to stay in this material world 
know that this material world is temporary and full of misery and not just the earth plane not just the bhuloka all the way to brahmaloka all the way down there is death birth and death so don't aim to be in this world come to the spiritual world which is the tad dhamam paramam mama that place from attaining which no one ever goes back so try to come to that place now from 23 24 and uh, sorry um 23 to 26 23 24 25 26 these four verses lord krishna is describing the destination of those yogis who make progress or try to make spiritual progress but not through bhakti yoga through the other yogic processes like gyana yoga karma yoga dhyana yoga those three processes so um i will read the translations of those and then we will summarize but this is not relevant for devotees or bhaktas for bhakt those who are practicing bhakti yoga so these verses 23 to 26 don't apply to anybody who is following this class this is there as a fyi for your information if you are following karma yoga gyana yoga bhakti yoga then the uh, dhyana yoga karma yoga or gyana yoga not bhakti yoga then this may apply to you but in this class we are exclusively focusing on bhakti yoga as the primary process so these verses do not apply to you but still we will read them 23 o best of the bharatas i shall now explain to you the different times at which passing away from this world the yogi does or does not come back so chaiva yoginah this yogi is mentioned here are mentioned as all those yogis except bhakti yogis okay so that you have to understand this is applying to everyone except bhakti yogi so what happens to them those who know the supreme brahman attain the supreme by passing away from the world during the influence of the fiery god in the light at an auspicious moment of the day during the fortnight of the waxing moon or during the six months when the sun travels in the north so a lot of details are here um during the shukla paksha during the shad masa uttarayanam the sun goes in uttarayana which means the northern hemisphere and dakshinayanam in the southern hemisphere so these are all the some of the details but this is for those yogis who have successfully completed the process of gyana yoga karma yoga or dhyana yoga and they go to gachanti brahma brahma vido so they go to the gachanti gachanti means go to brahma which means to the the brahman which means they attain spiritual realization but at the brahman level so these are those yogis who have been successful in their process of gyana yoga dhyana yoga or karma yoga and this is how they pass they sometimes these yogis can even choose when they will leave their body and they wait for the right time the right time when the when the cosmological uh, situation is right then they leave the body they have attained so much uh, control through these other processes but suffice it to say that those processes are very hard and not recommended especially not in the kali yuga then 25 the mystic who passes away from this world during the smoke the night the fourth night of the waning moon or the six months when the sun passes the south reaches the moon planet but again comes back so these are the yogis who have made progress but not fully successful so they go to the moon planet to the chandra loka to the planet of the moon god but then they come back to the earth planet so they come back to the material world they stay in the material world so these are the ones who are little less successful and then 26 lord krishna is summarizing these processes according to the vedic opinion there are two ways of passing from this world one in light and one in darkness when one passes in light he does not come back 
and when one passes in darkness, he returns. So these, this is a summary. So those who pass in the, those who are successful, they go to the Brahman, they are the ones who pass in light. The ones who are unsuccessful or less successful, they pass in darkness and they go to the moon planet or other planets in the upper realms, but they come stay in the material world. Okay, so I covered those verses till 26. Now 27 and 28 are very, very important. So Lord Krishna is saying here the same thing that I just said earlier. I, I, of course, I picked it up from here. But the point is, Lord Krishna is saying, don't worry, these processes do not apply to you, Arjuna, because you are a devotee. So he's clearly saying, ignore this. Ignore the last four verses. Krishna is telling Arjuna. So what is Lord Krishna saying? Although the devotees know these two paths, O Arjuna, they are never bewildered. Therefore, always be fixed in devotion. So even the devotees know these paths. And now whoever read, reads Bhagavad Gita knows these paths. All the devotees read Bhagavad Gita. They know these paths, but they don't focus on that. When I should die in the northern, when the sun is in the northern hemisphere, southern hemisphere, all this stuff. They don't try to calculate and try to optimize the, how they die. They try to optimize their Krishna consciousness rather than trying to optimize all these other circumstances. So Lord Krishna's advice is optimize your Krishna consciousness rather than trying to optimize your material condition. So therefore, always be fixed in devotion. Tasmat sarveshu kaleshu. So if you remember, this, is, this was there in 8.7 as well. Tasmat sarveshu kaleshu. What was the verse there? Tasmat sarveshu kaleshu maam anusmara yuddhacha. That's how the verse starts. Mai arpita mano buddhir maam evaishyasi asamshayaha. So tasmat sarveshu kaleshu yoga yukto bhava arjuna. Therefore, all the time just focus your mind on me. Yoga yukto bhava arjuna. So Lord Krishna is saying tasmat sarveshu kaleshu. He cannot say two different things in one verse. Therefore, always do this. And in the other verse, I'll say they always do this. That, that would be contradictory. Tasmat sarveshu kaleshu. How can you ask somebody to do two different things always? If I tell you always be a good person and then I turn around and tell you always be a bad person. That doesn't make sense. I can say in the morning, be a good person. At night, be a bad person. Fine, that may make sense. But when I say always, there has to be one single instruction. There cannot be two instructions in always. And in always, in 8.7, Krishna is saying, tasmat sarveshu kaleshu. Sarveshu kaleshu means always. Ma manusmara and do your duty, yuddha. Remember me, ma anusmara. And here he is saying yoga yukto bhava arjuna. Therefore, yoga yukto means ma manusmara. They have to be equal. If A is equal to B and A is equal to C, it means B is equal to C. Therefore, yoga yukto bhava arjuna means ma anusmara yuddhacha. So Lord Krishna is saying for devotees, these processes of how to die do not matter. Just remember me while you are alive. Don't worry about death. And 8.28, he goes even one step further. He says that a person who accepts the path of devotional service, which is bhakti, is not bereft of the results derived from studying the Vedas performing sacrifices, undergoing austerities, giving charity, or pursuing philosophical and fruitive activities. Simply by performing devotional service, he attains all these. And at the end, he reaches the supreme eternal abode. It's a beautiful verse. Very, very, very reassuring. So chapter 8 ends on an extremely reassuring note. Lord Krishna is saying that my devotee is get the benefit of all other processes. So not only you don't have to worry about the other processes, 
you get the benefit of all those other processes simply by doing bhakti how wonderful and the verse starts with vedeshu yagyeshu tapashu chaiva if you see vedeshu who studies vedas gyani yogis the ones who are in gyani yoga study the vedas yagyeshu who performs yagyas the ones who are doing karma yoga they are performing yagyas and tapashu tapa who performs tapa the dhyana yogis so by saying vedeshu yagyeshu tapashu chaiva lord krishna is covering all the three processes of yoga gyana yoga karma yoga and dhyana yoga and he is saying that uh by pursuing one who accepts the path of devotional service yogin param sthanam upaiti chadyam param sthanam upaiti he attains the param sthanam the supreme destination upaiti means attains so and he gets the benefit of all other processes so basically the point is that one who is performing bhakti yoga does not have to worry about oh maybe my friend who is following these other processes maybe he is better off he will get more benefit than me no lord krishna is saying you will get the benefit of bhakti yoga plus you will get the benefit that he is getting so how wonderful this is okay so um this uh, this is how chapter 8 ends and therefore the focus is to perform bhakti yoga and the benefit of dhyana yoga gyana yoga and others is you are able to control when you die you are able to control the situation you are able to have a good situation at death okay lord krishna is saying by performing bhakti yoga you get the benefit of that which means indirectly acharyas have explained lord krishna is hinting here that i will take care of you i will take care of your situation at the time of death those other yogis are able to take care of their own situation but since you get the benefit that they get i will take care of you you will definitely get the same benefit they get and lord krishna will arrange the situation to occur in such a way that the devotees of lord krishna will have a glorious death they will have a painless death absorbed in the thoughts of lord krishna so that is the promise of lord krishna at the end of the 8th chapter so lord krishna is saying there is no need to follow any other process just follow bhakti yoga you will get the best result plus you will get all the result of the other processes on that note we will end this class today there was one question very good question that came on the anonymous question form it was a long question it was about uh, um how love is based on uh is based on our needs or our desires from the relationship very nicely worded question i will answer it in the next time i just read it but i didn't have much time to think about it however that question did contain some very deep aspects it was sent anonymously to me if that person is here right now i invite that person whoever it is to if you want to reach out to me privately for one on one discussion or if you feel more comfortable talking to my wife i i don't know the gender of that person either so or you want to talk to both of us together or whatever that is you know uh that question was very nicely phrased a very genuine question and uh, i we make ourselves available if you want to have some discussion about your life situation um and and want to you know discuss about it so please reach out to us email us email my wife or uh whatsapp and if you would like to talk to us we are we are fine with that i will answer the question in the class at a general level i won't go into specific details so all those uh, th- that's 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 what we will do okay thank you so much for attending i am so deeply honored by your presence i will see you next time and we will start the ninth chapter uh it's a ve- it's the most one of the most important chapters and we will this is very very deep into bhakti yoga 
So we will spend four or five classes on ninth chapter. It's a very important chapter and I spend the most amount of time on it. We'll go through it very slowly and then we will pick up a lot of speed from the 10th chapter onwards. So we will see you next time. Please don't miss ninth chapter, which means the next four or five sessions. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.